Welcome to today's CLE. We are having a tremendous discussion this afternoon, offering an, an introduction and overview to the Bystander Initiative here at the SJ Quinney College of Law. Uh, my name is Michelle Oldroyd. I am the CLE Director for the Utah State Bar, and I'm part of the group of hosts for this event, including the Utah Center for Legal Inclusion, the litigation section of the Utah State Bar, and Parsons, Bailey, and Latimer, who have all convened this discussion for us. Uh, we're so grateful for the work of our partners, for the co-sponsors without whom this wouldn't be possible, but indeed we're really most grateful for the work of the panelists and their fellow students who are really ensuring that our legal community is one that models listening and providing a platform for survivors to have discussion that hears them, that respects them, that, that understands their situation and their perspective about not only what happened to them, but what goes on in our community and how we discuss that. Um, that we as practitioners of the law really embrace the notion that we owe to each other the best part of ourselves and our relationship building. And I would say to you that the panelists really embrace that as the mission of their work to do that work of listening, to do that bit of respect and relationship building, but indeed to embody a kind of compassion that I think is rare and, and deep as part of our practice in, in both civil and criminal law. Um, they're offering to us an opportunity to better understand the roles of bystander and enabler in criminal law scenarios, but also to understand that all of our organizations have moments where we may be a bystander or an enabler for good or for evil. And the idea of that is to not only distinguish those roles, but then to improve our culture both with each other and with our organizations such that we don't sit as idle bystanders who are silent in the face of what could be righted through our own speech or the speech of others. And I think that it is a rare day where you convene a conversation, not only that uh, enacts some academic rigor about the law, but really can move and inspire and change relationships. So I give you our panel with that in mind, that we're so grateful for your work and your time spent, and that we feel honored that you're part of our Utah legal community. Thank you. Push yeah, technology. <laughs> so good afternoon. My name is Amos Giora. I teach here at the SJ Quinney College of Law, and I you know, direct, created whatever the Bystander Initiative, which is why we have gathered today. And for me, it's obviously a particular pleasure to introduce the two of you who are graduating from this great law school on Friday. And so this is literally your last moment as students. And the reason that the two of them, Anna and Dan, are, are with me here is that they worked with me over the course of the past year on two separate law review articles, which are in many ways the essence of the Bystander Initiative. Full stop. The Bystander Initiative intends to do exactly what Michelle just said, which is to educate, address, discuss the role of the bystanders and enablers. I've been working over the course of the past 10 or so years on this issue with an eye towards criminalizing the enabler and the bystander because I'm convinced or at least I've convinced myself that without the enabler and or the bystander the perpetrator cannot do what perpetrators do and as bad as the perpetrator perpetrators are the for me the really important issue to address is the ecosystem of the enabler the ecosystem of the bystander and so over the course of the past years this is what I've been working on and indeed the law school created this program I believe we are the only law school in the United States that has this. And the idea really is to educate the public exactly as Michelle said about the role of the individual, whether you are physically present or you're in a position to prevent harm, crime to a vulnerable individual, and then what are the consequences of failing to do so and the ultimate, from my perspective, the requirement to hold them accountable. It's clear when one reviews history that crimes have been committed forever and ever, obviously by the perpetrator, but the failure to aggressively ad address the role of the enabler and the bystander absolutely ensures that the perpetrator continues acting and the vulnerable continues to being vulnerable. Full stop. I will begin with Anna. Just, so Anna and I co-authored an article 
which she will explain, which address the, the role of the enabler with respect to extraordinary harm, violence to women inmates in a California prison, which by the way, in the last in the last two weeks has been closed literally overnight in a manner that one can, the only word for how it was closed, because we're in polite company, would be called inhumane. If we were not in polite company, I would use other adjectives in terms of what was done to the women inmates. It is, it defies any defiement. And it is all about the enablers. And then after Anna, I'll turn to Diana. She and I co-authored a Law Review article about the role of enabler in the context of faith and church and the harm that that causes. So I begin with you. Wait, and I turn this off? Yes, good job. <laughs> um, first, I also wanna say welcome to the people on Zoom and also everybody who's here in this room. Um, if you do have questions, you can go to slido.com and then I believe it's just the bystander, the word bystander, and then we'll be able to see the questions up here and we'll answer as many as we can, but we'll kind of first explain the research that we did. Uh, so Giora and I, and also a graduate, uh, or not a graduate student, an honors college student, uh, co-authored a article titled The Ominous Sound of Keys, The Enabling of Sexual Assaults in Prison. And so uh, Giora was introduced to this. People reach out to Professor Giora all the time, and, and a former inmate had reached out to him and just kind of let him know here are some things that are going on at this prison in California called FCI Dublin. It's located uh, just outside of Oakland, California. And uh, so we began researching it. And uh, there were a lot of news articles. We got in contact with a journalist who had, uh, a local journalist in California who had been keeping up to date with everything, where there were. Uh, several inmates that were sexually abused by male guards. And um, I believe that FCI Dublin became very prominent in the news because two out of the eight that have so far been indicted, one was a was the warden of the prison and the other another one was a the chaplain who had sexually abused women. So as of today, seven have either been found guilty or pled guilty, and then one is going to trial. And so we started to look at this and honestly just ask, how did this happen <laughs> to countless women in this prison where they were being sexually abused and assaulted by these male guards, including the warden? Um, and so we started to discover and we name in our article one specific enabler, but then we also looked at the system as a whole where the system was not set up to really prevent this. Now there is PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, but that has no teeth and essentially really isn't doing what it was intended to, which is to eliminate prison rape because it's clearly still going on. And so uh, the person that we named is a man by the name of Lieutenant Stephen Putnam. He was the head of SIS at FCI Dublin, which is the Special Investigative Services. And so their job is to investigate any complaints within the prison, whether it be staff on inmate, inmate on inmate, that is their job. And according to his own testimony in Warden Garcia's trial, he was backlogged about 100 cases, some dating back as far as six years. And according to BOP policy, those should be completed within 180 days, not six years. And so, of course, during this time, many of these women are still being housed in the prison with their abusers. And so the only reason that this reached outside of the prison walls was because a female inmate who was abused by the warden spoke to her sister. Her sister went to the attorney and the attorney went to the FBI. But this has been going on since about the 1990s at FCI Dublin. And then as Giora just explained two weeks ago, it was abruptly closed. Um, I mean, just a quick Google search of FCI Dublin will bring up tons and tons of articles about what has been happening. Um, they announced on a Monday that it was going to be closed and they wanted everybody moved out by a Friday. Um, and they just started busing women across the country to other prisons. And it was quite horrible, the accounts of these women. And so anyway, so we looked at that and we looked at 
just the enablement that occurred. There's These women would not have continued to be abused at the rate that they were if it weren't for the enablers. Those who knew what was happening could have done something to stop it, but decided not to for whatever reason. And there could be a myriad of reasons for why they decided not to do anything. Um, but yeah, so that's the research that we did. <laughs> that article, well, one of the important contr contributions of the article, and Anna mentioned the undergraduate student who worked with us, his name is Zev Gorfinkel. We called him Boy Wonder. He's literally a mathematical genius. Mm -hmm. And what he was able to do was to data mine an extraordinary amount of information and is able, we are able to quantify in the article the dollars and cents cost or input dollars and cents amount of the of the harm caused by enablers it is to the best of our understanding the first time there's ever been actually a mathematical which i can't do i mean i can't even turn this damn thing on but mathematical study that quantifies the harm caused by the enablers which I think is one of the reasons that there's been so much um, attention shown, shown on this article. Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here today. My name is Diana Pagasian, and before I get started, I'd like to extend a trigger warning. The article that Professor Giora and I wrote, um, the article we co-authored, Sacred Secrets Enabling Child Sex Abuse, discusses child sex abuse. So if, you, if you'd like, please go ahead and mute me, or you can leave the room if you feel uncomfortable listening to that. Um, so Professor Gior and I first began working on this article when we read on the news, and we call it the Arizona case. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of it, but essentially a child was being, a, a five-year-old child was being abused over the course of seven years by her father, Paul Douglas Adams, who had confessed to his LDS bishop of the rape that he was doing to his child, but the bishop was instructed by the LDS Church's helpline and by the law firm Curtin McConkie to, they directed him that he cannot do anything about it, which means he could not go to civil authorities or to the police, to anyone. Everything that remained within that conversation was strictly confidential. So Professor Gior and I decided to research the clergy penitent privilege, and what we came upon is that this is not a one-off instance. This happens quite regularly that, you know, a penitent will come in and discuss with the clergy of abuse that has been going on with a child, whether they have committed it or someone else. And the clergy cannot report, either because the clergy penitent privilege protects them from reporting those crimes or because their church specifically instructs them not to do so. In the article, we examined both the Catholic Church and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints perception on the privilege, and we have found some very interesting differences. Within the Catholic Church, regardless of what the penitent tells the priest, the priest cannot by any means disclose that information to authorities. However, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that information can be disclosed if state law requires. So in the Adams case, the reason why the bishop was instructed not to disclose the information and potentially save the child from seven years of sexual assault by her own father was because the Arizona clergy penitent privilege protects the priests from doing so. So the conversation between the penitent and the, and the bishop remained strictly confidential. During that time, Paul Douglas Adams was ex excommunicated from the Church of Jesus Christ and around 16 men heard there was a there was a small trial is what they call it and his membership was withdrawn but approximately 16 men knew of the abuse that was happening to MJ and her infant sister nothing was done about this until authorities were able to receive videos from New Zealand uh, showing Paul Douglas Adams abusing his children and posting those videos on the net so the article essentially proposes legislation that helps combat these you know, these enablers and make sure that individuals are given a chance to fully disclose to the police what is going on. Um, so we propose legislation to help combat that. And we also examine the enabling that was going on within these cases. So when you think back over the course of the past year as we worked on this, in terms of understanding the role of the enabler, that now you're almost a law school graduate, 
what do you think poses the greatest challenge in terms of quote unquote going after enablers? Why is it so difficult to do so? And what would you propose in terms of how to more, perhaps more effectively address this? I think one of the greatest challenges is the institution that protects the enablers. So for example, in this case, it would be religion. A lot of the individuals that we spoke to, you know, say that their tradition, their traditional beliefs would prevent them from reporting such crimes. And I think that it is the role of the state to, you know, get involved in those situations and make it a requirement, not make it a decision for the bishop to decide whether, you know, whether he's going to report a five-year-old being abused, sexually assaulted by her by her father, but make that mandatory so that they don't even have to make that decision. Because again, in these situations, the most appropriate authority to combat these issues is the state. The resources that the state may provide is just you know, completely different than what a bishop can guide you through within your counseling session with them. Fair enough. Same question to you. What, as you think back, think ahead, what poses the greatest challenge in terms of educating society, lawyers, that enablers indeed need to be held accountable? Well, I think specifically for our article is it's the bias that people have against people who are incarcerated, um, that they either deserve it or, you know, they committed crimes. So, you know, maybe they don't deserve to be treated with dignity. Uh, dignity. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that's one of the things, but I also think that um, in this case, it's, you know, we remind people it could have been you, your mother, your sister, your aunt, your daughter that was in this prison. FCI Dublin is a low level security prison. Most of these are low level drug crimes or white collar crimes are the people that were incarcerated in FCI Dublin. Um, and so I think that's been one of the could be, but also dealing with the federal government <laughs> um, and the Federal Bureau of Prisons. They keep everything very tight lipped. Uh, there's not much, um, uh, they don't, it was one challenge that we encountered was getting access to pretty much anything. And we understand security, you know, we weren't asking for the blueprints of the prison, but one thing that we did try very hard to get access to and that we tried to find was the SIS handbook. We just wanted to know how does the investigative process work? How is this supposed to work? Well, we located it and it's about 90% redacted. Um, truly the only thing that you could see was just like little sentences or parts of the table of contents. And so that was one thing, it was put under a protective order quite a few years ago, but um, just getting access and then you know we're um proposing federal legislation which with the political climate that we're in is quite difficult as well um and then anything to do with prison reform so there were just a lot of difficulties in locating and accessing material we were lucky that we had a lot of sources that we spoke to former guards um, we spoke to a former warden. Uh, she wasn't a warden at FCI Dublin, but she was a, a warden at another federal prison. And so um, I felt very grateful for those who were willing to speak to us about their jobs and what was happening, and especially those who worked inside FCI Dublin, who genuinely tried to do what they could within the bounds of you know, they had a certain, you know, hierarchy that they had to go through, or they had a certain way that they had to report things, and they really did try their best. Um, but then one of them was a whistleblower in this case as well, and she was uh, retaliated against, even though technically that's against the law. That doesn't, I guess, you know, obviously they're still doing what they want to do to her. Um, but so I'm immensely grateful for those that spoke to us, and just how important this specific issue is and especially to those people we talked to former psychologists at fci dublin we spoke to three former psychologists at fci dublin and each of them have now left working for the bureau of prisons completely because um one psychologist specifically said to us he said i i couldn't do my job anymore he said i would these women would come to me they would tell me these things i would report it nothing would get done and he's like i just couldn't i couldn't do what my job was supposed to be anymore and so 
yeah, I think it's just difficult really just working with the Bureau of Prisons. We didn't speak with anybody specifically in the leadership of the Bureau of Prisons. We did reach out to each of them and they each declined to speak with us, but um, we did try. <laughs> so one of the things that from my perspective in terms of the article with Dan and the article with Anna and looking at the role of the enabler is it's going to require, if you will, a cultural shift in terms of recognizing that the system, what, what one of my former students called the ecosystem, it is the ecosystem of enabling. And that ecosystem of enabling is cuts to the core. Again, I go back to Michelle's introductory comments. For members of the bar, if we, if we are, if, underline, if we are truly serious about addressing crime, whether it's the kind of crime that Diana and I worked on or this kind of crime, we can talk about the perpetrator until tomorrow, but that's not going to address and or resolve anything long term. The perpetrator, from at least from my perspective, and perhaps I've convinced myself, the perpetrator is the specific individual in the here and now, even if they're a repeat offender. But the enabler needs to be perceived, the institution needs to be perceived as the more strategic um, party responsible for the harm. And in both articles, what we really saw are institutions that have made a clear decision to protect themselves. And in the article with Diana, we can talk about faith and faith and faith and faith, you know, until tomorrow morning. And I speak as someone who's a secular Jew who doesn't, I'm not a person of faith at all, but it became very clear to us and the people we interacted with that the mantle of faith was used as a mechanism for protecting the institution directly and the individual indirectly. I mean, the individual is the, the perp, he's the, he's the, he or she, I want to emphasize, he or she is the beneficiary of the decision by institutional actors to protect the institution. And in the article with Anna, the person she referenced, the, the head of their the in-house investigatory unit, um, Putnam, it was really interesting. We spent a gazillion hours asking ourselves, what was it in for him? And we also asked and we tried to inquire whether or not, I hate the term, apologize, trigger warning, whether or not Putnam was, a, was a, if you will, a beneficiary, if, this sounds awful, I know, but if women were made available to him. And we found no proof of that whatsoever. So the question really became, why would a guy like this protect the institution when he's in the head of the investigations? And you would think as the head of the investigations, he would understand his duties to the people he's, who are, he's investigating. And it turned out that his perception of his role was to protect the institution. That's what an enabler does. And in the article with Diana, when it became very clear that the church was protected, I think that'd be the right word, by the law firm here in town, that made it very clear to the, to the bishop, no, you may not go to law enforcement. That did nothing more than ensure that the, the, the girl, girls, the girls would be subject to additional extraordinary harm by the father. So at the end of the day, the father committed suicide, no loss to mankind. But the fact is that the girls were utterly and totally left unprotected by the church's um, law firm in the name of protecting the institution. And again, and I'll turn it back to Diana here in a second, but if we're really serious about this, then I think that particularly members of the bar, there's no choice but to go after the enablers because otherwise the, little har the harm caused to these little girls will be just, you know, another, I hate this expression, but it's just another, you know, check, 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 because there are a gazillion other girls like that out there. Yes, and this doesn't just go to, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Within the Catholic Church, we've, spoke, we've spoken to survivors, Timothy Lennon, particularly referenced in our article. His experience with the clergy penitent privilege was that he went to a priest in hopes of reporting abuse that he was suffering with another priest, sexual abuse. And the priest said, pretty much, can't do anything about it, forget about it, you know, there's... There, there's not much I can do. And so again, these priests were hiding behind the cloak of tradition. And we mean no disrespect to religions of either faith or those who do not practice within the faith, but do have a clergy, do believe in the clergy penitent privilege. But we do believe that children need to be protected first and foremost. And if a child comes up to you and talks to you about sexual assault that they are encountering, you must report that, which is what precisely what our legislative recommendations provide. 
when Diana, re when well, when Diana references the word tradition, obviously the first thing that runs through my mind is fiddler on the roof, right? Tradition. So tradition can be a positive, but as we learned here, tradition is 100% a negative. Because what it did is it reinforces, in the name of tradition, the continued harm to individuals, children, who the institution knew were in harm's way. And that, for me, is, is mind-boggling. Again, a person not of faith, how an institution, whether it's this church, this church, or you know, obviously in Judaism, we have this also, but how an institution knows that there are five-year-old girls who are being sexually assaulted and in order to protect the institution, really what they do is they say to the little girls, you know, sorry, or not sorry, but you are on your own. You are not protected. That for me is something that in terms of the bystander initiative, which Michelle referenced, that's something that for me is just simply um, unviable, unsustainable, and simply wrong. Back to and the article. If I may, no, Professor Gewer. Sure. Um, so when I was reading the police reports of the abuse, you know, the first things through my mind was this is terrible how could someone do this you know but the most important question that i think was evolving in my head was how could you know multiple people learn about this know about the details of the horrific crimes against you know a five-year-old child and then in the other case her infant sister that was just born how could they know about you know these things happening and fail to report because failing to report is essentially enabling the continued continuance of the abuse because the abuse continued on for the next seven years and the only reason that you know state authorities learned of the abuse was because someone in New Zealand decided to report this to the United States again if if this wouldn't have happened they might have continued on being abused like this for the next decade or so and so again when we're thinking about enabling and when we're thinking about you know oh how did the Holocaust happen we don't of course, you know, we, we look at Hitler and we think the things that he committed were horrific, but we also look at the society that surrounded him, that supported him, and that allowed the continuance of these horrific crimes to continue, as in the same case here. In terms of legislation, make you legislator for the day, how would you go about putting this into action? From law school to being a legislator. <laughs> I haven't even graduated yet. Um, oh, goodness. See, it's hard because for our case, it's federal. So I think you, you have to make people understand, and I think that's why our article includes both numerical numbers of what this is costing, um, and then as well as in our article, we include real stories we include some of the statements from the victims and their victim impact statements we include um you know things from news articles from um other uh academic articles but um gira mentioned at the very beginning that we have that that numerical number of how much it costs and um based on our estimates it's 76 uh billion dollars and that's not even including the about 80 billion that it already costs to just run prisons. Now that number includes federal and state. Uh, a lot of the data that's available doesn't separate between a lot of it. Um, and there's also a, a smaller population of federal female inmates, but that doesn't make it any less atrocious, atrocious what happened to them. Um, so, I mean, something that we've done is I've emailed countless legislators, <laughs> so many legislators. Um, we have been in contact with some offices where they've said that they're, you know, they're going to use our article, they're reading our article, um, and some we haven't gotten responses from, but I have emailed lots and lots of people who have worked on prison reform in the past or currently are um state legislators as well and so that's one way that i feel like we're kind of trying to get it passed is the federal legislation it's also difficult figuring out the wording which is not my expertise <laughs> um of how you can make it a crime to be an enabler and we also want to make sure we're not telling people you know put yourself in harm's way 
we're not saying, you know, if you see somebody drowning, make sure you jump in and try and rescue them or else you're going to go to jail. We're saying the least you can do is call 911. Or in this case, the least you can do is report it. Report it outside the prison walls because as far as we know, nothing ever really made it outside of these walls because I'm sure that if the FBI found, well, when the FBI did find out that the warden was abusing, um, I believe five inmates came forward, that something would have been done and something was done once the FBI discovered it. But it's, to our knowledge, it never made it outside those prison walls. Um, also, just quickly, somebody asked if we'll send links or copies of the articles. I don't know how to do that. Michelle, do you know? Yes, Kate. Perfect. So we'll email them to Michelle and then she will email them out to everybody. But yes, we can definitely get you copies and links to the articles. Um, and then of course, just another reminder, if you have questions, you can throw them in Slido, hashtag bystander, and then we'll be able to see them and answer them. Matt has a question. Can I just ask one? Yeah. Professor, when you started your research, and you know, enabler and bystander, those are broad terms. So like Anna just referenced with the drowning, when you started this, did you prisons or, or were you really just broadly thinking in terms of so Matt when I started this I had never heard the word enabler or bystander before um, I fell into this utterly utterly by chance make a very long story short I'm the only child of two Holocaust survivors I grew up in, uh, I grew up in a home in Ann Arbor where the word Holocaust was never mentioned so I knew zero about my parents and frankly to, to my everlasting shame I knew nothing about the Holocaust, which is beyond embarrassing. While I was training for the Salt Lake Marathon, my running partner, who's not Jewish, asked me, you know, we were in the middle of one of those awful 20 mile runs. And she said to me, how did this, this being the Holocaust happen? And I had a brilliant academic answer, which shows you how remarkably intelligent I am, which was, I have no idea. And I came back to my apartment in Sugar House and I said to myself, because you know, I speak Hebrew, I said, must speak, which is in English, enough. I became autodidactic on the Holocaust. And it became apparent, I mean, you can't read everything, right? But it became quickly apparent to me that there is an issue in the Holocaust that had never been addressed before, and that's the, the legal culpability or accountability responsibility of the bystander. So that led to a book called The Crime of Complicity of the Bystander in the Holocaust. And I researched my parents without any cooperation from my parents, and I thought I was done with this. And then I was having lunch with my dinner with my publisher of the American Bar Association in Chicago, and the editor said, well, you're a huge sports fan, which I am. And he said, you've heard of the Catholic Church. And I said, even though I'm Jewish, I have heard of the Catholic Church. He said, well, hell, there's your next book. And like a total idiot, I agreed. And that became a book called Armies of Enablers, which is about Michigan State, Ohio State, Penn State, Catholic Church. USA. You, you, right, you, USA Gymnastics. And then I thought I was done with this. Um, and here I am, what is it now, almost 10 years later, with you know, books and articles like anybody in this business. And I'm totally, I have convinced myself of, I think of three things. One, again, is the son of Holocaust survivors, to your point. The Holocaust, with all due respect to Hitler and friends, the Holocaust doesn't happen without the enablers and the bystanders. And that clearly serves as, if you will, as the guide to all this. But because I teach law, right, and we are have to have narrow application of terminology, one of the challenges when one talks about the enabler and the bystander, I think really is the core of your question, is not to overstep, not to make it so unviable, untenable, that people will be immediately dismissive of it. Trust me on this one, it's difficult enough to get legislators to agree on, on issues like the bystander. We had success here in Utah because of Representative Brian King, a huge, huge, huge shout out to him. Criminalizing the enabler is, is going to be really challenging because there it is perceived as one step removed because the enabler distinct from the bystander is not physically present. I mean, the bystander is right there. The enabler is, is removed. There's a long discussion about crime of omission, crime of commission, and there's no doubt that to your question, one has to be really careful not to overstate or not to overstep. On the other hand, it's again, having perhaps convinced myself that without the enabler, I mean, take what the, the article with Diana, without the, I, I, I'm sure this, I don't mean to offend anybody, right? But the church here was, was an enabler. 
that and the law firm is an enabler. I mean, clear as the, my hair is non-existent, that they both were enablers because they knew that these girls, these five-year-old, right? She was being assaulted by her father. It was obvious. The father confessed. And in spite of that, the institutions, the church and the law firm said that the institution is more important than the individual. That to me is, is so, again, to be polite, unviable is the polite word. There are other words. And that's something that needs to be addressed. I don't know if that answered your question, Matt. Um, we have a question that is going to be for Gior and Diana, probably mostly Diana, um, that's about your article. So they ask, if the outcome that you want is to punish confessors and the result is that new confessions don't occur, how does that protect children? And then, um, I believe this is all from the same person, it's all anonymous, but it all kind of goes along. And then, what actual evidence do you have to jump to the conclusion that confessions necessarily enable abuse instead of helping abusers to stop future abuse. Um, and then also that confession includes no counseling, that you're presuming that confession includes no counseling or anything to attempt to help the confessors. And I know that's stuff that you guys kind of addressed in your article. Yeah, for sure. So we've definitely addressed that in the article, but um, we've spoken to numerous scholars and people of faith in both religions, and that was one of the biggest pushbacks we've received is, okay, well, if, if the clergy has to report, will people stop confessing to these crimes? And here's the thing that we, you know, we've discussed this with, with Professor Giora, and we've come to the conclusion that either way, nothing was done to help the child in that case. And it was as if there was no confession at all. There was no counseling because it did not help the child in any way. The only thing that it did was, you know, maybe relieve the guilt that the father had because now he shared this. Now he was, you know, forgiven in a way. So we, we have received a lot of pushback specifically on in this area, but we believe that either way, no, no help was given to the child. And even if, people continue to confess and the, uh, the clergy has to report, then that's going to be a little bit different. So in this case, if the bishop had reported, then the children would have been saved seven years of abuse. And then what was the other question, Anna? Uh, let's see. Um, so I'll just read the last two again. So uh, what actual evidence do you have to jump to the conclusion that confessions necessarily enable abuse instead of helping mm -hmm. abusers to stop future abuse. And then they say, you seem, to be, uh, you seem to be presuming that confession includes no counseling or anything to attempt to help the confessors. Okay, so for the last question, the counseling. So I think this is a little different for the LDS church and the Catholic church. Uh, when we were interviewing both bishops and priests from both religions, what we have came across is that the LDS church plays a more active role in the confessions. So the bishop will ask you questions and actively engage and ensure that, you know, that you are actually seeking forgiveness and that you are trying to amend your actions. So there is definitely counseling on that end. In the Catholic church, it's much more passive. So the priest will not question you. The priest will not, you know, solicit more information about your your confession. So there is counseling for sure. Whether that counseling helps is a different question. In Paul Douglas Adams' case, seven years of counseling did nothing. And to the second question, whether we have evidence that, you know, the clergy penitent privilege does in fact enable child sex abuse, we do. And that is in, you know, the excommunication trial of Paul Douglas Adams. There were 16 men who heard in a small trial about the abuse that was ongoing. And none of those 16 men reported that a little girl was being abused and raped by her father. In fact, the abuse continued for years afterwards. It was only until, you know, by accident, someone came across the pornographic videos that Paul Douglas Adams had made with his children that this was actually reported. So yes, we do have evidence. And in the case of Timothy Lennon and in other cases that we have referenced in our article where, you know, the priest or the bishop was given awareness that this abuse is happening to a child, they may have counseled the perpetrator, but no good ever resulted from it. Uh, 
are <laughs> So within the Catholic Church, I would say that it's a no directly, and this comes from Pope Francis in the statement that he gave in 2017, I believe we reference it in the article as well. He pretty much says that no, there is there should be no uh, exception to the clergy penitent privilege. What's What happens in confession stays in confession. In the context of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I think that is where we can actually make progression with legislation, and that's where a difference can actually happen. So for example, in Arizona, Arizona, if there was no clergy penitent privilege, if there was no exception to the mandatory reporting laws, then that bishop would have been required by the law firm to report the abuse. They were, it would not be a matter of discretion by the law firm or by the bishop. It would be mandatory. So in that case, I think that legislation you know, and conversations like this could really play a role, especially with the fact that in the LDS handbook, it specifically says that if state law requires requires mandatory reporting, and if there's no clergy penitent privilege, then you must report. So we do definitely think that this is a time when legislation could make a direct role in stopping abuse of children. I would add to that in terms of um, the financials. So when I wrote about Michigan State and the University of Michigan and USA Gymnastics, Michigan State paid out, I think, $450 million and the University of Michigan, I think, will pay out $490 million. For these universities, that's chump change because they're not paying it. Who's paying it is the insurance company. And there's been discussion with insurance companies whether or not insurance companies should say to the university, we're not paying this, you'll pay. And then the university's response has been across the board, oh no, we can't pay this because if we have to pay this, we have to take it out of the endowment and we have to take it out of the endowment and we will injure unintended consequences, students who are presently in school and we won't have money for scholarships and so on and so on and so on. Going around and around and around. Maybe, I mean, 450 million to me sounds like a ton of money. Um, for these insurance companies, it's, it's, a, it's a drop in the, in the wherever and that provides them the cover precisely what Diana is telling you, that the institutions seemingly prefer to pay out when they are caught, rather than making the kind of significant adjustments that they need to make. So what some institutions do is that they, um, if you will, I don't know if they use the word fire or they terminate or they push out the door, particular individuals, and I think that's more a check the box, rather than addressing concretely the far larger systemic issue that needs to be addressed. Take this article. I mean, there are clear systemic issues at the Bureau of Prisons that run way beyond FCI Dublin. Um, we, in the last two or three weeks, have, have been reading about and talking at length about the way in the, the manner in which the prison was closed. The inhumane treatment to the women um, inmates defies description. We're in 2024 in the United States of America, and because it's all public knowledge and we're all adults here, when the women were told that they're going to be moved from jail from jail A to jail B in the middle of the night, they were denied sanitary napkins, and if they had them, they were denied them. If they denied them, I mean, it's beyond humane. It's extraordinary. But it all goes, from my perspective, all goes back to the enabler, because none of this would have ever happened without the enabler. But for the Bureau of Prisons, for and I hope there will be um, congressional testimony on this, congressional action on this. I don't. I assume there will be lawsuits from here to there and back against the Bureau of Prisons. I'm sure there are lawyers out there who are eager to go after the Bureau of Prisons. It strikes me as low, low hanging fruit. It's in, I mean, this is inhumane treatment. I mean, it, it defies description, and the fact that this has been going on and on and on and on. I mean, that's one of the repetitive patterns that one sees. Again, regardless of what, which of these institutions we've looked at. There's nothing new here. The only difference is that hopefully, perhaps because of our work, 
the two of them, that th there will be more and more attention drawn not to the perp and not to the bureau, but the, the enablers, that, sorry for the term, the enablers who enable this. And back to Michelle's comments, the role of the, of the legal community here and of legislators also, and, and you know, I've testified here, there, and back, there is hesitation because it's perceived as a crime of omission rather than a crime of commission. But there's no doubt that this is a crime for which people must be held accountable because, I mean, the case in point is the inhumane treatment that, we, that these women were subjected to two or three weeks ago when they were told at three in the morning that you're, we are now transferring you to a different jail. And by the way, think about this. When they're transferred to a different jail, their families don't know. The fast, families have to come, you know, their people have visitation rights. Who the hell knows where they're going? Not to mention also Bureau of, Bureau of Prison employees who are now going to have to be relocated. But more importantly, the, the treatment of the women inmates. America, 2024, if you have nothing better to do this afternoon, go online and read how these women were treated. It is humane is because we're a polite company here. Inhumane is the polite word. I could give you other adjectives. It's all because of the enabler. Um, and on that again, uh, so there have been several civil lawsuits just based on what occurred at FCI Dublin against the BOP, and then they also named specifically individuals in there. And uh, in many of the civil lawsuits, Stephen Putnam, Lieutenant Stephen Putnam, is named as somebody who didn't uh, commit these atrocious acts against these women, but who knew what was going on and did not fulfill his job, which his job was to investigate and send it up the chain. And uh, it would go to um, like a outside investigative, even though it's all very interconnected. Uh, and we've been in correspondence with attorneys who are working on these issues and representing the victims. And they have told us that they're going to use our article in their litigation um and w one lawyer in particular she emailed us back and she was just like yes this is what i've been saying for so long is that there are so many other people involved in this than just the perpetrators who need to be held accountable for what they did or didn't do in this case which was just their job <laughs> their job description and so um so Anyway, so that um, there is a lot of that. And so we're hoping that our our article will help in the ongoing litigation uh, f against the BOP and against individuals. And I am sure more are going to come after the absolute mayhem that occurred with the transferring of these women to prisons across the country. Um, just, I mean, hearing their accounts, I mean, truly, you just Google FCI Dublin articles galore. And there are many accounts of, um, I would say Lisa Fernandez, who's the local reporter, has the most uh, firsthand accounts. A lot of the inmates really trust her and they would speak out to her or their family members really trust her. But truly what happened, it, it defies any, any what, a, what humanity should be doing. And so anyways, that's what I would say to that. I would just add one more thing to your question. Institutions hide behind money. It doesn't solve a damn thing. It just, in essence, what it really does is it perpetuates the system. And it's, it's easy to hide behind it, especially when you're not the one who has to actually dole out the money. There is another question, and I'll, I guess, point this towards all of us. But it says, is the end goal to shift societal behavior so that even inappropriate, although, although not necessarily criminal behavior, for example, racist or sexist comments are not enabled? Yeah, that's a very good question. I would say that the end goal is that if you see someone in harm's way, especially a vulnerable individual or child in the case of our article, you do something about it. And I think that this can shift society towards, you know, implementing changes that go beyond what is criminal and speaking out about things that are wrong, but are not necessarily criminal, but are immoral. So I do think that it could provide a secondary effect like that. But I think for the purposes of our articles and our work, we are focusing on protecting vulnerable individuals, whether that individual be imprisoned or whether that individual is a child who is unable to you know, make the decisions to stop being in harm's way.
Um, I'll just share quickly. So I, this is like a personal experience, but I took uh, the seminar class by standards and enablers from Giora, where we talked about all of it. We read a lot of articles. We talked about a lot of stories and examples and it has affected the way that I now approach things. Um, and I share a story in an, in an article that we are in for the school um, about how I was driving on 215 headed to the U coming from um, like the Draper area and I was on 215 and there was this man who it was a very foggy day like visibility was very poor and there was a man just walking on the side of 215 just like on the freeway and I I had the thought you know somebody's gonna hit him because visibility is so poor there's like this much space between him and like you know the cement wall and this in the street where the cars are and of course we always have that thought well somebody else will call I'm sure and then I remembered Giora's class and I was like, I will not be a bystander in this. And I thought, how would I feel if I got home and I saw on the news that this man was hit and I could have at least called Highway Patrol. So I called Highway Patrol and I let them know and I said, hey, you know, there's this man. And they were like, thank you so much for calling us. We're going to get somebody out there right away because I was genuinely worried. I don't know who this person is, but I just thought he's going to get hit because visibility is so poor and you can barely see him you know he's wearing dark clothing and um and i didn't want him to get hit and so i remembered giora's class and so i think making people aware of this i think it can it can change the way that you approach everyday life it can change the way that you know maybe you're gonna think twice now maybe you're gonna think yeah i should call the police for that or i should do something i should report this i should you know take the extra action instead of being like oh i'm not sure like i don't want to you know inconvenience anybody but just like making that extra step like just working with giora researching this and being in his class last year has changed the way that i approach things now so i sometimes when go online to read criticisms of my work which is um and there's a lot um, and I put aside, as Michelle knows, I also get, in previously, previous books, I get death threats, which is what it is. But one of the criticisms of me is that, because of this, that I've been accused of trying to change the social contract. I think the person meant it negatively. I actually took that as a hell of a compliment. Because it strikes me, if we're going to help the women here and the children here, and if that requires changing the social, social contract, if the person meant that as a dig, hell, I'll take that as a, uh, as a, as a thumbs up. Because at the end of the day, for me, it really is about the, com the complicity of the institution. And Matt, it goes back to your question, and am I going on and on about the Holocaust? There is no doubt, there is no doubt that for me, both my parents are deceased, but for me, th this entire Uber project runs 100% through the, the, their unimaginable Holocaust travails, which were only possible because of the enablers and the bystanders. Other, if we don't have other questions, Michelle, I turn it back over to you because we're at the top of the. Uh, we, have, we have one more oh, go ahead. question what, that go ahead. we can do super quickly. Um, so somebody just asked, "Are you confident that your principle won't be misused? Calling someone a bystander or enabler is extremely broad. This seems like that could easily be, be misused by someone who has a different understanding of those terms than you use." The answer is it keeps me up um, at night because one, there are many things that keep me up at night. This is one of those because the last thing you want to do is overreach and overbroad and arbitrary and capricious. And I, that question is spot on. But if we will send the article, you'll, right, you will see in the article how we narrowly define and narrowly apply both terms precisely for this reason. Because the last thing you want to do is to cast too broad of a net because then you lose any credibility whatsoever with the potential audience. And it's for that reason that we really are um, take a, a narrow definition and a narrow application of a narrow definition. Well, I want to thank our panelists and our assembled audience, both online and in person. Um, and I also want to encourage all of us who are interested in furthering this conversation. Uh, we are happy to host additional CLE conversation on the topic. The co-sponsors of this event would be glad to reconvene uh, at a future date if that is valuable to the audience members. Uh, we would certainly be glad to invite Utah lawyer legislators to the conversation in order for them to be part of this conversation, which could have 
tremendous value and actually a work product um, to come about for, based on the CLE conversation. And I promise to send out the articles along with your certificates of attendance, noting that that will be in your inbox here in the coming few days. So please don't hesitate to be in touch with the CLE department if we can further help you reach either the authors um, or um, these presenters or our co-sponsors. If you'd like us to help you do that, we'd be more than happy to facilitate that. Thanks for your attendance. Thank you.